my childhood. Thanks for listening to Ruin My Childhood, the podcast where we decide if some things are better left in the past. I'm Mike. And I'm Kat. And we're back. It's been a couple of months. We just had busy lives. We needed a little bit of a break. Super busy. We so, were working like 60 hours a week. Yep. A lot of working, a lot of travel. Katrina's been out of town almost every weekend for the last almost three months. Yeah. Pretty close. It's been a lot. Uh, this but is it's the good. first weekend I was home for about six weeks. Yeah, so but it's good. We, uh, we're we're back. We're refreshed. We're going to be talking about one of my favorite childhood movies. Are we refreshed? And as fresh as we're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> we're like last week's produce fresh. Yeah, we're like frozen produce fresh. All the nutrients are gone, but we still feel good about eating them. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so what are we going to be talking about this week, our first episode back? Hook. Hook. Tell me about Hook. What do you remember about Hook? Not much, honestly. I don't really like this movie. What? Uh, yeah, some, it was hard to follow as a kid. I pretty much only watched it when it first came out on VHS. I think that might have been the last time I've seen it. Has Robin Williams? Robin Williams. It's a Peter Pan thing. But, you know, it's. I think my problem with this is I love Peter Pan. You claim to love Peter Pan. I love Peter Pan. And this... <laughs> This story, it just deviates so much from it and in so many ways. And it's it's a little twisted, honestly. Uh, I loved this movie growing up as a kid. It was one of my favorite movies and one of my least favorite video games because it was so damn difficult. Like, I don't think I got beyond like the first or second level in the Super Nintendo game. It was super tough. Okay, first of all, what would compel someone to make a hook video game? And second, why would you buy it? Uh, This was one of the games that my grandparents had at their house. They just, for whatever reason, had a Super Nintendo for the grandkids and bought a bunch of games. And I used to play this all the time when I would wake up before everybody else. I would go play this game in their little den. It was great. And it was a very hard game. And back in the 90s, they made games out of everything. Die Hard, Home Alone. Everything was a side-scroller game. And so it was very difficult. But I loved this movie. Obviously, Robin Williams was a big part of our childhood. Uh, Steven Spielberg. Uh, directed this obviously a big part of everyone's childhoods going John back Williams to, John Williams did the score <laughs> it's very obvious you can always tell obviously working with Steven Spielberg but uh, I love this movie I, I remember the kid uh, when his son is like mad at the adult Peter Pan because he missed his baseball game and then there's a point where like the pirates put on a baseball game for him and they get the home run kind of confused so they go run home Jack Run home, Jack. And I remember Bob Hoskins as Smee, and he's like, Smee, what about Smee? Smee, Smee's me. And I just remember loving this movie, and Dustin Hoffman as Hook is great. I'm, I'm really excited to go back and watch this movie. It's been, I don't think I've watched it since I was in high school, maybe? I'm feeling lukewarm about it at best. I'm really excited. Steven Spielberg is top three to five directors in my book, and uh, he, he, there's very little he can do wrong in my book. So I'm ready to go back and watch this. All right, let's do it. Where are we going? To Never Never Never. Robin Williams. So happens, I am a lawyer. Kill the lawyer! Junior Roberts. Kill the lawyer. Bob Hoskins. I give you Captain James Bond! And Dustin Hoffman. Hello, children. As book. Rated PG. Rental guidance suggested. Starts Wednesday at a theater near you. We're back. We just watched Hook, and I didn't realize how long this movie was. It's it's almost two and a half hours long. It's very long. It's two hours and like 26 minutes. It feels minutes. long. And you don't get to Neverland until like 35 minutes yeah. in. Yeah. But uh, maybe I'll just uh, summarize it real quick. Is that what I should do? Sure. All right. Pretty simple plot. Peter Pan decides that he wants to bang Wendy's granddaughter. It's pretty messed up. That's We'll get into that. But he decides he wants to come back to the real world and real. I can never say real world. <laughs> yeah, you real need to world slow world. down, uh, buddy. He comes back to the real world and decides <laughs> real to, world. <laughs> decides to grow up. He becomes this businessman. He's in like acquisitions and mergers as everybody is in the 90s. And he kind of forgets what it's like to be a child. He's not a very good dad. Uh, I mean, he provides for his family, but he's just he's not there emotionally. And he goes to visit Wendy, and Captain Hook kidnaps his kids, and he has to go back and remember what it's like to be Peter Pan. Wow. As an adult. Does he leave that job at the end? No, but he decides he needs to have a healthier work-life balance. Got it. And stop killing the middle class by building massive corporations. Yep. 
Well, and this this has a little bit of a green friendly endangered species thing. Like his he freaks out. What causes this whole movie to really kind of happen is while he's in London, he gets a call from his coworker and basically says they found like some rare barn owl on the property that their company is trying to purchase to build some giant corporation. And he loses it on his kids because they're just making a ton of noise, trying to get his attention. And he just screams. And Wendy, who's played by uh, Maggie Smith, just looks devastated. Like she looks like she got shot in the chest. Like, oh, Peter's yelling at his kids. <laughs> and that's what kind of starts the movie. And I kind of feel like Wendy's a witch and caused the whole movie. I really don't know. What do you think? You know, there are so many parts of this film that just don't make a lot of sense they kind of hint at things and then don't follow up on them later give me an example and i feel like wendy's supernatural abilities are kind of in that realm yeah this movie is kind of like one of those magic realism things where magic just kind of exists but it also could possibly be a dream but then they kind of it definitely can't be a dream at the same time and there are parts where the script doesn't really match up with what you're seeing on the screen for instance, when he's talking about uh, towards the end of the movie, he's telling the story of how he ended up getting adopted. Oh, I know what you're going to say. But before he ends up getting adopted, he went to Neverland and he says that he eventually left his mm -hmm. family. But they're showing an image of a baby. Like an infant. Like an infant left in the rain by himself and then he gets picked up and taken in well, it's he like says he does he leave as an infant he does so what's crazy <laughs> of is his own volition he somebody asked him what he remembers and before or wendy asked him what he remembers at the beginning of the movie he's like i don't remember anything beyond like this when he was about 12 years old and then he does a flashback like you said and he says he made the chance to run away be, or he took the chance to run away because his mom was talking about how she wants him to be a lawyer or a doctor or something and he doesn't want to grow up and he says he ran away, and you just see him kind of rock as a baby in his carriage, and it just, like, rolls down a hill. And his parents don't chase it or anything. And like you said, he's just lying in the rain. Yeah. And then Tinkerbell just comes and picks him up. It doesn't make any sense. And I feel like what happened with this film was too many big names and way too much money, and they probably filmed a lot more than what ended up in the film. Let's, and I think it kind of got happened. butchered in editing, despite Spielberg's expertise. So there was a large scene that involved like 300 extras that ultimately got cut from the movie and Bob Hoskins felt really bad. So he actually invited all those extras out for beer later on. He paid for like 300, 300 crews worth of people to basically party. Wow. And Bob Hoskins is a good dude. That's such a weird thing. It, wait. Where, Apparently it was a where are there 300 extras except for Neverland? Aren't they all children? No, like on the pirate ships and like <laughs> in the pirate town, there were a ton of people wow. there. Wow. So apparently it was a super complicated scene. So maybe it was like an action scene or maybe the baseball scene. Like maybe there was more to the baseball scene or something. I don't know. But uh, yeah, they did that. That's odd. Uh, yeah, I, the whole thing, it just, you know, I really wanted to like it. And it was really charming in certain places, but it just felt so disjointed and really didn't ultimately make a ton of sense. So, aside from it just being full of, you know, 90s movie whimsy. tropes. And, yeah, and whimsy. So there's, I, there are a lot of things I really like about it. Like, visually, I think it's really interesting, and the special effects for the time are pretty solid. There are two things that I really want to bring up that I feel are kind of messed up. The first one is is the whole Peter Pan coming to the the real world is they at one point they show this uh, the montage of him visiting Wendy over the years and it's just like a little girl and then it's Gwyneth Paltrow in like made <laughs> up to where. look younger and then a little older than a little older and eventually she transitions into Maggie uh, Smith and there's a it's point quite where the leap. right <laughs> and Maggie Smith says or Maggie Smith Wendy says something along the lines of like I'm too old now I've got children their children have children and I can't I can't go with you and then Peter goes and he sees Moira who ends up being his wife and he looks at her and he's like I'm gonna give her a kiss and she's like no you can't do that you can't get her her hopes up basically saying Peter broke her heart by never staying for her Mm -hmm. And he immediately goes to this 15-year-old girl that he's never seen before. And how old is he at this point? Or 12. Maybe she's 12. So he's supposed to be about a 12-year-old's worth of maturity and physical growth. And he sees this girl. But how long has he been in Neverland? Uh, we don't know when he actually visited Wendy. So we know at that point it's at least 60, 70 years. 
<laughs> so, but it, he could have been doing this for decades before he even met Wendy. Right. We really don't know. Uh, it's safe to say at least as far, maybe Victorian era is about as far back as you can go based off the buildings and the clothing, but you don't really know for sure. But it's super messed up. Like, Wendy basically says she was in love with him, and he he broke her heart, and I don't want you breaking my granddaughter's heart. And then he just decides to stay for this girl that he's never met or had a conversation for. Yeah. It's kind of it, messed up. It kind of makes no sense. And then the other thing that I thought was really disturbing is Tinkerbell is a full-grown Julia Roberts. I mean, a woman appears to be a very tiny woman. She picks him up as a baby mm-hmm. and raises him. Yeah. And then there's flashback scenes where she watches him fall in love with Moira and you also see her like watching him with um, Wendy and looks very jealous. Being so she, a creep. Being a creep, obviously in love with him, which is weird. And then, you know, when she grows up, she actually gets big towards the end of the movie and basically says, this is our chance. Like you could leave your wife and be with me. It's super weird because that's like his mom. Yeah, it's it's creepy. And then even <laughs> if he stayed, he would he would have presumably stopped aging at some point. Right? right but like how old are either one of them well she's clearly i I don't, I don't understand so how do the pirates did they arrive as adults yeah okay but he arrived as a baby and continued to age and then eventually stopped i guess you stop at about 12 you know i think neverland is just full of dead people yeah it could be a lot of people think that peter pan is really just about dead children like you never grow up yeah maybe because you're you died. dead but I'm, it's just odd it's odd but it's just super disturbing why how is it obsessed. just dead orphans and pirates but maybe they're not actually dead because they can come and go is <sighs> it did did wendy and john is it john no it's wendy peter and michael and did they die and then get resuscitated and that's how they come back? I don't know. None of it makes any sense. How they get there, how they get back specifically, why some people stay, why some people don't. Yeah. Right. Well, and then the other thing that doesn't really make sense about this movie, besides him not remembering, which because he grew up and he lost the childhood in him, is when he gets there, his training regiment. Like, it's supposed to be three days. Hook gives him three days to train and become Peter Pan again so he can have his war. So even you buy the he remembers and he learns the, how to be a child in his mind again, physically he is still a 40-something-year-old man. How is he doing flippy flips and sword fighting? And He can fly. He can fly, but still, like he, there's points where he just ju- jumps and does a backflip off of things. And even when he gets back into the real world at the end of the movie, he's able to, like, flip over a wall. He doesn't stick the landing. But he's still physically, like, vaulted over the wall. Age is a state of mind. I guess. I guess he's doing the same hallucinogens as Jack LaLanne. Right. And S- <laughs> Smee ends up at the end, back at the end of the movie as, like, a snow scraper dude. A snow scraper <laughs> dude. <laughs> and it seems like Wendy settled for a lost boy. Like, a lost boy left with her, and she, like, married him, I guess. Yeah. They don't really explain. There's this old guy who's crazy, who lost his marbles, <laughs> uh, and it, he alludes to a lot of things in Neverland, and then at the end, he actually ends up getting his happy thoughts back because he has his marbles, and he flies. But they never really explain what his relationship is to anybody. No, they don't. Maybe, it, if it was explained, it was probably in one throwaway line, and we missed it. Maybe. But what did you th- What did you think about Dustin Hoffman as Hook? I loved him as Hook. He, he was, was amazing. He was definitely a strong point in the film. His acting is incredible. The, the character was definitely slightly more well-rounded than a lot of other versions of Captain Hook. And also, is he a little bit gay? All pirates are a little bit gay. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like he and Smee have a, a, a rather old couple type relationship. But it was also kind of like that in the Disney cartoon where Smee just kind of... And also like LeFou... With Gaston, where they just have a smaller little henchman that just dotes on them. Yeah, but in the new Beauty and the Beast, LeFou is gay. Yeah. Gay for Gaston, especially. Yeah. So, I, I don't know. This movie, uh, Smee kisses him on the cheek as like a, a comforting pat sort of situation. Oh, that's true. He did. Yeah. 
I think I think they're a little gay for each other. Possibly. Which is kind of nice to see. Hook is super vain. In a somewhat positive light on yeah, the big screen. I guess. <laughs> uh, Hook, Hook is super vain. You know, he's got his, towards the end of the movie when he gets defeated, his wig falls off and he's like, give me some dignity, he puts it on and he's... You know, very balding, and his teeth are all messed up. But... Hook has always been a narcissist yeah. and and mentally unstable. They just kind of took it to another level in this one, which I enjoyed. His charisma or his his presence with both Smee and Robin Williams were great. Like there was some definite definite chemistry on set. Yeah. Uh, the stuff with Julia Roberts, there wasn't a ton of chemistry, but it turns out she wasn't on set with like anybody because she's so small so she had to green screen everything and apparently everyone called her tinker hell because she was miserable and kind of took it out on people oh geez <laughs> uh so that that happened that was a thing well this was probably one of the first films that most people had ever done that had a character entirely acting in green screen it, it, it just definitely wasn't had to done be one at the, the time first ones. It, yeah it definitely has to be one of the first it's probably hard as an actor in an industry where something hasn't really been done before if you can't wrap your head around it to have faith in what you're doing yeah totally it, it must be really demoralizing to be working day after day and you're one of the only actors you're acting with a tennis ball you're doing take after take and not really able to visualize what it is you're getting closer to or further away from in each performance you know you come back for notes after each take and it all must seem very abstract and be and not being able to bounce off of like robin williams especially yeah. when you're working with someone like robin williams like you want to be able to bounce off and react with that energy that he brings yeah it has to be really frustrating so i don't really blame her oh neither do i and i mean to go into something like this when you haven't seen a lot of examples on the big screen that takes guts and this could have been career suicide right and this is something that everybody wanted to do so this movie it's, it's very divisive some people love it some people hate it uh, even steven spielberg says that he was disappointed with the final result in the movie uh, and there were points where he talked poorly about the film uh, but he said the reason his favorite thing about the film was this is where he met robin williams and became his like best friend so they were really really good friends after this movie when uh, steven spielberg was filming um schindler's list i totally forgot the name of that movie for a second <laughs> when he was filming schindler's list he would get super depressed and the crew was getting super depressed because it's a really dark subject matter movie. Yeah. So he would actually call Robin Williams. Robin Williams would go on speakerphone and just tell jokes and, you know, for 10, 15 minutes to lighten people's moods. Mm -hmm. So when Robin Williams passed, Steven Spielberg finally kind of is like, you know what? I don't hate this movie anymore. I don't Aww. regret making this because if it wasn't for this, I wouldn't have had that friendship. Yeah. So I and think I'm that's sure good. there's a director's cut somewhere out there that actually makes sense. I think it makes sense. The only thing to me that doesn't really make sense is I do think the, the Julia Roberts, you know, wanting to bang a child is creepy. And I think... Okay, all of the time travel and relationship stuff is creepy. Yeah, all that of That stuff it. is Full creepy. Stop. The only heartwarming relationship in this is, is with the kids. me and Captain Hook. What about the kids? Yeah, the kids are all Maggie's right. great. The daughter. Yeah. She never, never doubts her love for her father. Jack, I, eh, he's kind of annoying. He's He's a bit of a... I almost swore on this. He's a bit of a brat. Yeah. Uh, but I think the kids were charming, and I liked all the Lost Boys, and we'll have to get into that. Rufio. Rufio is iconic. I guess. You don't remember all the girls wearing Rufio t-shirts, like, well into our teens? I do, and I never understood it. I thought he was kind of obnoxious. No, he was the leader they needed in Pan's absence. <laughs> all right. <laughs> but, I mean, I remember loving the characters he was you know kind of a badass he was best with the sword he had that weird wind board that was on a track so it didn't really need the the wind thing what is that actually called on a wind board the sail yeah it's a sail yeah it had a sail but it wasn't needed but he had like pseudo armor and he actually like held his own against hook and he had this little like hooky looky looky i got hooky and even hook respected him to an extent he's like rufio but he also knew how to defeat him with his vanity right uh I don't know. I feel like the character was just an unnecessary distraction in the plot. You think so? I mean, I think maybe, like you mentioned before, that there there should be there must be stuff that was edited right. out. Right. Because I feel like he probably was a bigger obstacle in like the screenplay. It seems like it, and like maybe his better parts were edited out because, from where I'm sitting, he just looks like an egotistical little kid. Well, and one of, that is one of the few Robin Williams scenes that we get. Because honestly, Robin Williams is the perfect person, at least in 1991, to play an adult Peter Pan and, you know, somebody who needs to be able to channel their inner child. 
Robin Williams was perfect for this, but they didn't, because he's playing this uptight person for most of the movie, and even once he becomes Pan, he becomes childlike initially, and then he becomes a little bit more adult-like when he realizes he has to save his children, so there's not a ton of rapid pace Robin Williams stuff except for one scene with Rufio where they're exchanging kind of insults back and forth. Yeah. And they they start getting a little bit more childish as it goes, but he says something along the lines of like, you're a paramecium, and Rufio's like, what is that? And he goes, a paramecium is a single-celled organism with no brain who has Peter Pan envy, which (laughs) which I thought was great because he has the childlike stuff but he also has like he's basically making a penis envy joke yeah uh which is some you know slightly adult humor so he's kind of blurring being a child and adult at the same time which i did like that i don't feel like we got a ton of robin williams you know shtick in this movie well and i i don't think there was room for it in the movie so that's totally fine with me and i don't kind of we get a lot of the same uh, I don't know. It sounds terrible because I love his work, but there are so many times when he ends up playing the same character in those moments. You're right. Yeah, absolutely. Between, you know, the genie and Mrs. Doubtfire and everything. Like even in Mrs. Doubtfire, which is great and is a live action movie, he does a lot of the same stuff the genie does. Right. Yeah. yeah so I, I think it's fine to have a slight departure from that, but yeah. I, mean, I doubt Spielberg <laughs> is somebody who's like, hey, just ad lib everything. Let's just go. Yeah. Every scene... In this film, there are really enjoyable parts, but there are also parts that don't quite feel finished. Like, there's just so much happening constantly throughout the entirety of the film and so many different subplots and so many characters that it kind of gets overwhelming for me. I kind of feel bad for the the daughter because they didn't really give her much to do. No. Uh, Jack got a lot more with it, and they basically used the daughter as a way to pit Jack against the dad. Yeah. Uh, like Hook specifically says, well, he went to her her play but didn't go to your baseball game. And her love for the family never never falters, where Jack actually ends up dressing up like Hook and like agrees to be Hook's son at one point. <laughs> Jack is not a very good child, and I think he gets way more credit than he deserves. Yeah, because he's kind of a, like, I understand he's disappointed that his dad didn't come to his baseball game. I do get that. But he was like an <laughs> on the plane. You can't say <laughs> Oh, he was a butthole on the plane <laughs> and you know he's like throwing a baseball against like the roof of the, uh, the yeah, ceiling but of the whose cabin fault is that it's, it's the parents, the parents fault. fault and then he he has this thing where uh i don't remember exactly how it goes but basically he calls out robin williams for lying and he goes hey my word is my bond he goes yeah junk bonds kind of thing <laughs> he's like completely disrespectful to the to his parents the entire movie yeah uh when his dad's obviously freaking out about this merger on the phone he's like oh, somebody shoot me he's just like bang yeah <laughs> <laughs> he's like he, i like the character's wittiness and that he's quick on his feet and i think he was really well acted but yeah the character's, the character's not a jerk he's not a good guy <laughs> he has very few redeeming qualities the other thing I didn't get, and this was towards the end of the movie, after they defeat Hook, they defeat him in front of the giant crocodile. And of course, you know, they do the thing where the hero lets their guard down for a second because they think the bad guy's defeated. And he kind of sucker punches him with the hook and like scrapes his arm. But then does a wild swing and like gets the hook inside the alligator's body, which is just set up to be like a giant clock tower. Mm-hmm. The alligator or crocodile falls down. You only see its head move once. Like, you see it kind of tilt down, and then the whole body falls, and Hook just kind of disappears. <laughs> right. And, Did he climb up inside? Right. And then the, the the crocodile burps, but it doesn't move or anything. No. Like, what happened? Yeah. I, it's just one of those parts of the movie that just doesn't make a lot of sense. No, it doesn't. What also doesn't really make sense to me is, like, once once Peter transforms back into Peter Pan and sort of remembers everything a little bit better it seems like he also really just doesn't care about anything else and in that regard i don't know like how does he still parent or go to work or continue with his life when they go home i think i i get where i do get what you're saying but i think what happened is initially he gets completely overwhelmed by being peter pan and he reverts like a childlike nature and it isn't until Tinkerbell brings up his wife 
where he kind of is like, oh, I'm an adult. And he yeah. starts to go through. And even while he's kind of having fun fighting the pirates until, you know, Rufio dies or his daughter screams, then he kind of snaps back into it. So he's definitely distracted. And I think being in the real world, eventually over time, he'll start to settle in. Like, he's obviously going to have to have his job. But I think he realizes his family's more important, which is good. But you're, you're right. He's definitely a different person when he comes back. Yeah, they're, they're just two extremes. And you see very little of those two sides being integrated into one cohesive, functional character. And it, it's almost like uh in the first iron man movie when Ro or when tony stark comes back and he just is like oh we're not going to do weapons anymore mm -hmm. and that's what that company did like what happens to this character afterwards when he's not a cutthroat lawyer right something's gonna have to change maybe he goes and is a, a lawyer for you know foster kids or something like that taking mm -hmm. care of kids in the foster and adoption agencies or whatnot i don't know but you're right something is his life will fundamentally have to change because he is a fundamentally different person at that point yeah and i don't know i mean i think if i went from being married to one version of him to suddenly having the other one it, that's a little off-putting but she also throughout the whole movie was talking about how adventurous and how funny he was and how much it was like being married to a child <laughs> initially and like and they they allude to it a lot that he's it, it seems like the change happened over the course of like once Jack was born. Mm -hmm. And I think it came from, he he says something along the lines of like, I always wanted to be a father and I always wanted to support my child. And I think he got into that role because he thought he was doing what needed to be done to take care of his family. Right. Because they mentioned that he promised Wendy he would visit her every year. And then they say, but it's been 10 years since that last visit. Right. And, and she is bitter. And she is. Well, and we should get back into the... I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Lost Boys again, but I think we should get back into the supernatural Wendy. Yeah. Because, you know, she's always like, oh, like every time he's kind of mean mm -hmm. to his kids. But when they... She kind of has this like look like something's going to happen. Yeah. And then they're at her charity event and Hook is going through and kidnapping the kids and everything. And the curtains at her charity event just like the windows blow open and wind goes there and the curtains are billowing. And she's just like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> like, like, she looks like she's either climaxing or oh like, I don't know. Like when we were watching it, I went jizz in my pants. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just like she knocks over a drink. Right. Uh, it's just this whole thing. And when she the way she's just so nonchalant about the kids being missing once Peter disappears, like Moira, the wife, is just like sitting there crying. And we don't know how much time passed in their real world versus how long they were in in Neverland because it was three days. Right. But we don't really know how much time. Was it overnight? We don't know. But she doesn't seem to really care. Like, she's once Peter's missing, she's just like, I know what's going on. Yeah, it's, it's odd. And, I mean, okay, so from Moira's perspective, your children go missing and your house isn't on lockdown 24-7 with a bunch of cops and investigating everything and... Like, it's London. She wasn't really doing much at that point other than sitting on the nursery floor and crying. Yeah. And then they came back and it it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. What, were this, what, I can't remember. <laughs> was there a scene with the cops where they were just like, yeah, there's not really much we could do? I don't think there was. I don't remember, but yeah. We don't see any of that the children's and disappearance where, really getting addressed. Where was she when Peter when Peter and Tinkerbell met? You know, and P Tinkerbell's like destroying that whole room, and she ends up putting him in a sheet and carrying him to to Neverland again. Like, no, none of the adults heard that. I don't know. Maybe they just mind their own business because they're English. Maybe, but I mean, the the wife you would think be like, where the where where the f is my husband? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, what's actually what's funny, going into watching this film before we, we went and watched it, I was looking at trivia and stuff, and there's a couple that ends up floating as they fly over. She drops, you know, her pixie dust. Uh, you don't actually see them, but it's uh, you just see a couple kind of silhouette flying. That was George Lucas and Carrie Fisher. They had oh, a little credit, uh, you weird. know, a little uncredited cameo. Uh, they also had... Uh, Glenn Close was the pirate that went into the boo box. Yeah, and I remember as a, as a kid, like I knew that once I got into like middle school, That's high school. A weird looking dude. But as a kid, I thought that was um, Kevin Klein. Oh, <laughs> it does look a lot like Kevin Klein. <laughs> and then my bud Cody from the Nerds with Friends podcast said David Crosby from The Birds and uh, 
Crosby, Stills, and Nash and Young was one of the pirates there as well. Oh. So that's pretty interesting, I guess. A lot of, lot of cameos. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we already talked about Gwyneth Paltrow, you know, in just montage scenes. Right. Uh, yeah, strange. I, it, it's definitely weird how many, once again, I can see why this was a big budget thing. Robin Williams, Steven Spielberg, classic Peter Pan thing. Like, this was a movie that should have been, like, a home run. Yeah. And, you know, I think, honestly, it's still good, but it's one of those things that it almost died in editing. Right. I'm trying to, oh, Lost Boys, I did, it, it's a little strange, and this is, once again, something that happened in the late 80s and 90s, even if it was a good kid, there's always a fat character. Yeah, and they really a, play up the the comedy of a child being fat. Right, so, you know, the way he eats the imaginary food and throws the food, and he does the, he does a lot of the same faces that Kenan Thompson did in, you know, Kenan and Kel, and They give him a lot of physical humor. And, like, just the big eyes and the, oh, face, like, where he just makes his mouth into an O <laughs> shape. And then, but in, it's even worse, there's a point where he rolls into a ball and <laughs> rolls down like a, ooh, what is that called a gangway yeah it rolls down a gangway and takes a bunch of pirates <sighs> these kids are fighting you know it's it's about what you'd say maybe about a dozen kids yeah roughly a dozen kids are yeah. taking on hundreds of pirates maybe oh, maybe maybe like two dozen lost boys yeah maybe total but the only ones that we actually ever see actually say anything or do anything is about a dozen of them right those were really fun scenes and those kids were actually all really really good and i i love the scene when when tinkerbell finally is like this is him like this is pan and you guys got to train him and you see like the little the little um black boy that goes up and he like starts pinching his face and (laughs) rubbing and rubbing his cheeks and he's kind of squinting and then he gets this big smile he goes Peter, it is you. I mm-hmm. see you in there. And you see him go from this like quizzical to pure joy. Like kids were really good. They were. They were really solid. And those scenes are so much fun to watch because you can just see how much they were really enjoying themselves filming it. Makes you kind of sad now because now they're probably all like washed up and broke. Well, they hating they, their just parents. a couple years ago. It might have even been last year. Um, let's see. It came out in 91. So yeah, uh, about three years ago in 2016, they had the 25th anniversary and all the Lost Boys got together for a photo shoot. Oh, really? Yeah, and they, they all look really happy and they all look like there's videos of them like hugging each other and they look really happy to see each other Aww. and they talk about how much they love being on this film. Nice. Uh, but yeah, all, the training montage was great. Uh, I love the whole like imaginary food thing. Although at that point, I figured a couple of days had gone by. So he went like a whole day or two without eating. Right. Because the only food that was there was imaginary. I mean, it, it's pretty crazy that they all... It builds their little mini civilization that they do. Yeah, it's awesome. They, they have it all together, and it's uh, it's pretty organized. And the mermaids are kind of weird. Like, I think Neverland is very realized. And they, they, they refer to the Indians. We never see them. And, Captain, you know, Captain Hook says something along the lines of, like, I'm tired of killing Indians and lost boys. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> I want a real fight. But, the, you know, I love how you see as they're flying over, you see, like, Part of it is covered in snow, part of it's desert, part mm-hmm. of it is rainforest, and it goes through really cool. Even in the Lost Boys little town, you can see as they're going through the little skate park thing, the whole topography and and ecosystems change in this small little area. I think that's a really cool little way of visualizing that. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, visually, it's a fantastic and gorgeous film and beautifully shot. So it it really has that going for it. And the scenes of the Lost Boys, I think, are genuinely enjoyable, no matter who's watching them. I agree. Let's see. Any Anything else you want to bring up? Mm, that's pretty much all I've got. I, I do have one problem with the Lost Boys. Rufio dies. Right. And they refer to Lost Boys being killed. And Peter Pan has a scar and on his left side, which he says, oh, it's where I got my appendix removed. It's the wrong side. Yeah. So clearly it's not. And that was just a story someone told him. But we know that Peter Pan cut off Hook's hand. Mm-hmm. We know that Lost Boys are killed by these pirates. Yeah. Rufio, we see Rufio die. Peter Pan has child soldiers. <laughs> no, we don't have no hashtag Peter Pan 91 like we had Coney 2012. <laughs> it's not okay. No. And they're not getting anything out. They literally do it just to fight. Like, it's not like they're defending their turf or anything. They just fight each other. Yeah. You know, of all things to have a problem with in this movie, I think the child soldiers are probably the least of my worries. What's What's the biggest problem? The the 
interspecies erotica. Uh, all, that's also marrying the pseudo sister's little weird. Well, then it's not a pseudo sister because she was he wasn't adopted by Wendy's family. It's just weird. It's just weird that it's really messed up that he actually had a relationship with Wendy. So I agree with you. It's a weird movie. <laughs> Ruin your childhood or not. I mean, I didn't like it that much as a kid, so I, I think I like it a little bit more now. I am toy- I, I still enjoyed the movie quite a bit, but I'm surprised that I was able to watch this as often as I did as a kid, because this is a long movie. It is a very long movie. And it takes a long time. It takes 35 minutes before Hook shows up. Your parents probably loved that. Right. Something to I love this movie all the time. Like, I watched it all the time. I really love this movie, so. But yeah, it's, I don't know how I watched it as a kid, but I, I enjoyed it. I do... Can, I, I do see some of the criticism that I've read online over the years. Right. Over the last 20 years, I have seen a lot of criticisms, and I, I do get it. I still like the movie, though. <laughs> Good. So, did not ruin your childhood? No, but I, it's tarnished slightly. Like, oh, it's aged. It has It's a little aged. dusty. It's fine. Uh, what are we covering next time? Uh, Darkwing Duck. Darkwing Duck. Yeah, Disney Plus started. We're very Let's excited. Let's get dangerous. And yeah. Darkwing Duck. Let us know what you guys think about Darkwing Duck on social media. You can leave a voicemail. What y'all remember about Darkwing Duck? Yep. If anything. Yep. If you remember it. The good, uh, the bad, the ugly. Thanks for for coming back to us. If this is your first episode, you know, thanks for listening. You can check us out on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at MDX Pods. If you want to support the show, you can go to MDX or Patreon.com slash MDX Pods. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.